crisis. Lessons learned during the biggest global crisis since the Second World War as the president of the Confederation of British Industry. It is my pleasure to invite Professor Raghunathan Rengaswamy, Dean Office of Global Engagement, IIT Madras, to deliver the welcome address. Thank you, Professor Raghu. Uh, welcome to the beautiful campus of IIT Madras for people who are coming here for the first time. Uh, thank you for being here, uh, and we are very excited to welcome uh, Lord Karan Billy Moria to deliver the address here. Uh, just a brief background of the delegation today. Uh, we've been at IIT Madras, we've been working with University of Birmingham very closely for the past uh, six months. And uh, typically, university relationships used to take a long time before, but apparently, uh, everything is hastened nowadays. So in the six months we have discussed and uh, we have come up with a program, a joint uh, master's program, MSc program in data science and AI, which we hope to uh, start in uh, August, 2023. So that's, uh, that's how close we have been working uh, with each other. Uh, we've also decided because of uh, the multiple commonalities that we have uh, between the universities, we've also decided to seed fund uh, about $50,000 uh, each university to look at joint projects, which uh, will help with this program in terms of uh, proposals that have components on teaching and research. So that's another initiative that, that we are talking about. And finally, uh, for people who don't know, um, IIT Madras recently announced a new department, the 70th department in the Institute on uh, Medical Sciences and Technology. And uh, we are hoping that we can partner with the uh, University of Birmingham uh, in terms of uh, looking at twinning that degree with uh, possible degrees in the, in the UK. So uh, there's a lot going on and uh, we are really, really thankful that you're here uh, to deliver this talk. And uh, I hope our uh, uh, relationship between the two universities uh, keep growing. Uh, thank you very much. And we are looking forward to listening to you. Thank you, Professor Raghunathan. Allow me to introduce now our guest of honor, Lord Karan Billy Moria. He's the seventh chancellor of the University of Birmingham, making him the first Indian born and youngest when initially appointed chancellor of a Russell Group University in Great Britain. A well-respected and successful businessman, academic and political figure, he's also the fund uh, founding chairman of the UK India Business Council, a deputy lieutenant of Greater London, and a former chancellor of Thames Valley University. Lord Billimoria is a founding member of the Prime Minister of India's Global Advisory Council. In 2006, he was appointed the Lord Billimoria of Chelsea, making him the first ever Zoroastrian Parsi to sit in the House of Lords. In 2008, he was awarded the Pravasi Bharti Sammam by the President of India. His other accolades include International Indian of the Year, India Link International, Entrepreneur of the Year, Ernst and Young, and many others. He is also an alumnus of prestigious universities such as Cambridge, Harvard Business School, and others, as well as honorary group captain in 601 Squadron Royal Air Force. In June 2020, he was appointed president of the Confederation of British Industry. Thank you for being with us here today, Lord Billy Moria. I, the stage is all yours. <laughs> you don't want to see me there the whole time. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, for both the very kind welcomes uh, and uh, a delight to be with all of you here at IIT Madras. Um, I don't see many, how many of you are students in this hall? Is there, are there any students here? Good, good. Okay. Thank you. Um, let, me, let me start by 
uh, telling you a, a story about two, two young boys uh, in Kerala and uh, many, many years ago. And the older brother got a place uh, at university, not university, the local school, six kilometers away. And the younger brother didn't get a place. So the younger brother would follow his older brother six kilometers and sit outside the classroom window with a hut. And the older brother would pass the books through the window to his younger brother. It's the only way he could start learning initially. And eventually, he managed to start school. And he did very well. He was very bright and uh, eventually got a scholarship to the London School of Economics, the LSE. Except his parents were so poor, they couldn't even afford the travel, let alone the clothing. And it took them one year to raise the money. And eventually he got to the LSE, he did very well. He joined the Foreign Service, the Indian Foreign Service, became an ambassador, rose to the very top. And then he became the first Dalit president of India, President Narayana. And I had the privilege of meeting him and I know his daughter who herself became an ambassador. So the reason I tell you that story is we are here because of the power of education. And that story says that anyone can get from anywhere to anywhere in life through the power of education. And those of you put your hands up who are students here at the IIT in Madras, you are very, very fortunate to be at one of the finest education establishments, I would say, in the world. Anyone here heard of Professor Clay Christensen? Anyone heard of Professor Clay Christensen? Okay. Um, he's one of the most famous business professors in history at the Harvard Business School. And when I became an alumnus of the Harvard Business School, my final lecture before I became an alumnus was given by Professor Clay Christensen. And it was a class, two sections, 200 of us, and he walked into the classroom, the lecture hall, and uh, very six foot eight. And he apologized uh, at the beginning of the lecture. He said, I'm so sorry, please forgive me, but I have not given a lecture for a long time because I have not been well. I had cancer, I've beaten the cancer, and then I got a stroke. And now I've just recovered from the stroke. And he said, you can see from my movements, I'm fine, but unfortunately it's affected my mind. And when I speak, I sometimes can't say the words that I want to say. And he said, if that happens in this lecture, can you help me please by shouting out the words? Because it might save some time. And through the lecture, we had to shout out the words many times. And at the end of the talk, he was in tears and we were in tears. And the message of his talk was very simple. He asked each one of us, have you stopped and thought, what is the purpose of my life? And I ask each one of you, have you stopped to think, what is the purpose of your life? And he said, linked to that, how will you measure your life? And there's no right or wrong answer. And I wish I'd heard that lecture much earlier in my life. Now, the students, uh, can you just put your hands up again, please? How many of you want to start your own business one day? Can I just see? A few of you, not all of you. Okay. Well, um, starting a business is, is, uh, is you know, a lot of people, quite often I will see lots of hands going up. And I say, how many of you will actually go out and do it? How many of you will give up that opportunity of a, of a job, of more security, and take the risk to start your own business? Um, and I, going around the research center today, meeting Professor Junjunwala, 
you know, business ideas are just amazing. And most of the business ideas are really simple ideas. And you think, why did somebody not think of that earlier? And today we were shown a wheelchair, which you could use as a wheelchair and wheel yourself. Or you could attach this motorized element that made it like a tricycle, just clip it on, and suddenly it turns into a mobile vehicle. Such a simple idea. Why didn't somebody think of that earlier? So you unclip it when you're indoors, and you wheel this around. When you want to go out, clip it on and you can go anywhere. And what a clever idea. What a simple idea. Why didn't somebody think of that before? And I think the best ideas, a hundred years from now, people will come up with ideas and they'll say, why didn't somebody think of that before? When you start in business, it's not easy because you have to cross what I call the credibility gap where nobody knows you, nobody knows your brand, you have zero credibility. I was in my 20s, I had no money, I had no experience, I had this idea. And what is it that gives you the ability to cross this credibility gap? And you know what it is? If you have the faith and passion and belief and confidence in your idea, in yourself, in your product, that gives people the faith to trust you, to give you a chance. And that is the key, is having that faith. And the other thing, of course, in, in business, when you, when you set off, is it requires guts. Those of you put your hands up and said, I want to start my own business. Will you have the guts to do it in the first place? But more importantly that, will you have the guts to stick with it when others would give up? And I've nearly lost my business three times, and it's never an easy journey. It's hopefully an upward trajectory, but it's always ups and downs. Can you stick it through? And the other thing is, I know we're in IIT, we're not meant to talk about things like luck, but luck comes into it a lot. Okay, I'm an alumnus of three business schools. I've done the equivalent of two MBAs. I've done hundreds of case studies, but I've never done a case study on luck. And the best definition of luck that I've ever come across was in the Harvard Business School classroom, where luck is defined as determination meeting opportunity. If you're not determined, you won't even see the opportunity. And the way I visualize it is waves going past you in life. If you're determined, you might just catch one of those waves. If you're not determined, they'll just go past you all your life. So determination, meeting opportunity. And the word serendipity, when people say serendipity, oh, how serendipitous, how fortuitous. Well, one of the professors, I chaired the Cambridge University Judge Business School for five years, and one of our very famous professors there, Mark Durand, he said that serendipity is thinking what is, is, is seeing what everyone else sees, seeing what everyone else sees, but thinking what no one else has thought. And you think about that, and you put that together with determination meets opportunity, and then you see why luck and serendipity work. Invariably, when you start in business, it's against all the odds. Uh, I had no experience. Um, I came up with this idea for Cobra Beer, um, which was a very simple idea. I wanted uh, a beer that tasted in between a lager and a nail. The refreshment of a lager, smoothness of a nail combined, they put a company, all food, and in particular Indian food. I saw Indian food get more and more popular in the UK. It's now the most popular food in the UK. Everyone eats Indian food. They cook Indian food at home. They buy it from supermarkets. They go to restaurants. There are 12,000 Indian restaurants and takeaways in the United Kingdom. And I could see this booming. And I said, I'm going to produce the best beer to drink with food. Simple, simple idea. But I was up against Kingfisher, the biggest beer brand in the UK, who'd been in the UK for eight years. I was up against giant brands like Carlsberg, who'd been around for hundreds of years and were in hundreds of restaurants and pubs. And I had no money for marketing. I couldn't even afford a branded beer glass. So when you have all the odds stacked against you, it's really, really tough. And invariably, any new business has the odds uh, stacked against them. And my father, by now, by the way, when I start in business, he became commander-in-chief of the Central Indian Army. 
His headquarters were in Lucknow, in charge of 350,000 troops. And when I was developing Cobra Bay, I would go and go and spend some quiet time in the period with him. And I remember going to my father, Dad, isn't this great? My own business, entrepreneur, Cobra Beer, isn't that exciting? And I didn't expect any money from him. In those days, army officers got paid very badly. He said, what are you doing? All this education, and you're becoming an import-export wala. Get a proper job. Because by then, I was already, I had a degree from India, a law degree from Cambridge, and a qualified chartered accountant with EY. I said, what are you doing? It's ridiculous. He became my biggest fan once we succeeded. Now, any business, I have a little bit of a checklist that you can apply to any institution, any business. You can apply to the IIT, you can apply to the University of Birmingham, and you can apply to, to Cobra Beer. Is a checklist of my 10 Ps of any institution or business. The first P is product. You've got to have a really good product. In my case, Oh, by the way, if I, if I ever boast, please bear with me. At Harvard Business School, they said, be confident, but not arrogant. Be ambitious, but also be humble. Be humbitious. So humbitiously, I say, my beer is one of the best beers in the world. I've won 100, and, I can lose track now, it's 135 gold medals. IIT, one of the best institutions in the world. Birmingham, top 100 university in the world. It's a good product. Next is price. Are you selling your product at the right price? Now, my product is an expensive product. It's a, not a value for money product. You could also have a value for money product. So you've got to position your pricing correctly. The next P is place. There's no point having a product unless it's available. And so in our case, in restaurants and supermarkets and exported to many countries, your product's got to be available. The next is promotion. You've got to promote your product. Now, I started off with not even a branded beer glass, but now we market in every possible way. And however brilliant your organization is, you're always competing, you've always got to market. And promotion. Now, if anyone studied marketing, those are your four Ps of marketing. Yeah. I've got my extra six Ps. The next one is people. Whatever business it is, this institution is all about people. You can have the fanciest buildings like we have at Birmingham, you come around a campus, it's the most amazing, amazing campus. A state of the art. Wow. Useless if you don't have great people. The staff, the academics, the students. That's what makes a great institution. I may be a manufacturer, I'm a proud manufacturer, but it's people that make any organization. Now, the next P is finance, spelled PH. You can't do anything without the money. And money is key. And the most difficult thing when you start a business is raising money, and particularly for an unknown brand. The next P is passion. There's no point doing what you're doing unless you love it. And I always say, follow your passion, not your pension. So whatever the students over here, follow a career that you really, really love. Don't just do it because it's going to pay you well or everyone else is doing it. Do something that you really, really love. My older son went to one of the best universities in the world, followed the herd into management consulting, into a top management consulting firm. And within a year, he realized this is not for me. And he'd always wanted to apply to the Foreign Service. And he applied to the British Foreign Service, got onto the fast stream. Just like India, it's very difficult to get into the Foreign Service. And he's the happiest person. He's been there for two years. He loves it. He's found what he absolutely loves. He's earning a fraction of what he was earning as a management consultant. But he loves what he's doing. The next thing is partnership. Partnership, partnership, partnership. And that's what we're doing here with IIT in Birmingham is partnering. And the way we run our businesses, when I started my business, I treated my shareholders as partners, my employees as partners, my suppliers as partners, my customers as partners, my advertising agents as partners, my accountants as partners, my lawyers as partners. Everyone's your partner. And that is a different mindset. And the next is principles. It is better to fail doing the right thing than to succeed <coughs> doing the wrong thing. And finally, there's no point doing it unless you make a profit. And it's not a dirty word, it's a necessity. 
And I'm proud to say the University of Birmingham is a very financially successful uh, organization and we plow back our profits into more and more for our university and our students and our community. I'm delighted to have my Birmingham team with me over here. We've got Robin, Professor Robin Mason, uh, our Pro Vice Chancellor in charge of all our international engagement. Um, and great to have you here, Robin. Uh, it turns out we were university contemporaries together, although we didn't know each other at university. And um, I've got Dipanka here. Where's Dipanka? Who's our head of India and South Asia. Um, and, and many other teams, Tony and um, Luke and Mark and all of you. And we've also got the British Deputy High Commissioner here, Oliver. Thank you so much for being here. So you've got a, 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 a great team um, over here. Our ambition at Birmingham, we're top 100 in the world in the rankings. We want to be in the top 50. So, you know, it is good, better, best, never let it rest until good is better and you're better, best. So we've got to keep striving to do better. Um, and our university is ancient, not compared with Bologna or Oxford or Cambridge, but 900, 1900, it was founded in 1900 by Queen Victoria, opened by Edward VII, her son, the buildings. And Indians have been at Birmingham University since 1909. And uh, it's a great, great university, 10 Nobel Prizes. And I, in the House of Lords, you have to declare your interest. I declare my interest. My grandfather graduated from the University of Birmingham in 1931. His daughter, my mother, graduated from the University of Birmingham after having gone to Queen Mary's College here in Madras. And she then graduated from the University of Birmingham in English and in history of art, followed by her younger brother, who was at IIT Madras, and then transferred to the University of Birmingham to follow his engineering, mechanical engineering, and did his PhD at the University of Birmingham. So my uncle started this partnership you know, way before we're starting it right now. Um, so we have an India Institute. We have 8,000 international students from around the world. And the new Indian education policy, uh, you heard I'm the founding chairman of the UK India Business Council. We've been saying for years to India, open up, open up, open up allow foreign universities to open up in India. It's for your good and the foreign universities. And universities like us, we wouldn't be doing it to make money. If we make the money, it's plowed back in, just open up. And finally, we've got this um, new national education policy that is going to allow the top 500 universities in the world to open up in India. And I think that is wonderful news because it helps. It's a win-win for absolutely everybody concerned. Uh, research collaboration. My takeaway, one of my biggest takeaways from my time here this afternoon is Professor Junjunwala saying, why, why, why can't we do more to partner and do more collaborative research together? Unbreaking, world-beating research. Why, why? The UK, you should be here. I said, come on, I'm volunteering right now. Birmingham University, we're starting a joint degree. Let's start. And you know the power of this, and it was Professor Robin Mason at a at the British Council in Delhi on one of our visits a couple of years ago, he laid out a chart, and I can't remember the exact figures, to show the power of collaborative research. So I'm, don't hold these figures, I'm just using illustrative figures. So let's say we at Birmingham have a field-weighted impact of about 2.2. And we do research with another university say in, in India, wherever, that has a field weight at risk of 1.7. You put the two together when you work on a project and that research is 5.2. We've shown it with Harvard. Let's say we're, you know, we're 2.3, Harvard is 2.7, it's 5.5. Not that much higher, but the power of that collaborative research. The more of it we do, um, I'm going to follow up with our science minister and make sure uh, that we do, do lots more. So the students who put your hands up, how many of you want to go and study abroad after you finish? Yeah. Can I see? One. The others don't. 
Okay, all right. That's unusual, by the way. I gave a talk at Dhaka University in, in Bangladesh last year, and there were hundreds of students there. I said, how many of you want to actually study in the UK? Every single hand went down. So studying abroad is great. 750,000 Indians students do that every single year, which is, which is fantastic. Um, and one of my roles is I'm, I call myself the head of international students in, in the UK. Um, I chair, I'm president of UKISA that looks after the affairs of all the in, um, international students in, in the UK. And also I chair the all party parliamentary group on international students. And we want more and more students to come particularly from India. And I'm delighted to announce that we now, on this visit, uh, I'm announcing the Chancellor, uh, Lord Bellamoria's scholarship to an Indian student to apply for, to come and study at the University of Birmingham with all fees paid and accommodation paid. And four, four runner-up, there'll be four runners-up who will have a lesser amount of funding. And the winner, I will mentor them, invite them to the House of Lords, meet them, and hopefully give them some advice. Uh, we have several partnerships in India with universities. At any one time, we've got 40 research projects. But before that, I just want to emphasize one more point. Research is fine. It's very important. You know, the QS rankings, a lot of the waiting is for research. But the most important thing to me is also teaching. If I tell you a, a quick story, when I joined the House of Lords, I, I've been there for seven, nearly 17 years now. When I joined the House of Lords, I was the third youngest peer in the House of Lords. I'm still one of the younger peers in the House of Lords because our average age is 70. And I remember after I, soon after I joined, uh, Lord Rees, Lord Martin Rees, who was then Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, Astronomer Royal, President of the Royal Society, he said, look, Karen, we're getting President Abdul Kalam to the Royal Society, and we're going to give him the King Charles Medal. But the, only the second time this medal has ever been given in history, because it can only be given to a head of state or a former head of state who's a scientist. And the winner before that was the Emperor of Japan. So at the Royal Society, big thing, he said, I need your help. You've met the president before. Just be with me. So we were walking around showing President Abdul Kalam, who had met a few times before, and they'd brought out Isaac Newton's papers, his actual original writings, because he's a former president of the Royal Society. And as we were walking around, it was just amazing. And I just innocently asked the president, I said, Mr. President, where did this all start for you? The whole entourage stopped. He said, Karan, you know where it started? He said, I grew up in Rameshwaram, an island, for those who don't know, in between India, Tamil Nadu, and Sri Lanka. And he said, I was a very poor family. I went to the local school. And at the age of 11, my teacher on the blackboard drew the picture of a bird and explained the concept of flight. And he said, I was mesmerized. I just wanted to know more about flight. I want to know more about physics. I want to know more about science. What happened? He ended up being a scientist. He ended up being a rocket scientist. He ended up heading the Indian space program. And he ended up being the most popular president of India ever. And it all started with one teacher. So that power of teaching. If I ask every one of you, can you all remember in your school over here, at least one teacher who's made a real impact on your lives. Can I just see a show of hands? Can you all remember at least one teacher who's made an impact? Look at that. Yeah, we wouldn't be here without those individuals. So the power of teaching, I think, is really important. Um, now, one of the things we've got to do here at IIT Madras and at Birmingham is make sure that you get work after this, that you get jobs. Now, luckily, most of you from these two institutions don't have a problem. Um, but there, is, there are certain things that, let me just ask you a question. No right or wrong, okay? There's a no right or wrong answer. Be honest with yourselves and with me. How many of you think you're creative? If you think you're creative, put your hand up. If you think you're not creative, keep your hands down. There's no right or wrong. Who thinks they're creative? Who thinks they're not creative? 
Hands up if you're creative, hands down if you're not. Just keep them up or down. Thank you. This is about what I get. I ask this question all around the world. Half the hands go up, half the hands stay down. And I'm asking it very deliberately because when I was, when I was a schoolboy, I was told quite clearly by my teachers, by my family, Karen, you're doing well academically, you'll do well, but you're not creative. Why? Because I was used to art. I couldn't draw, I couldn't paint, not creative. I was forced to play the piano. I passed grade one. Please stop, spare us. You're tone deaf, not creative. So I went through my whole education, school, university, just believing and being told I was not creative. And then I started my business, became an entrepreneur, and I started Cobra Beer. And I realized I'm really very, very creative. And one of the most important skills in life, let alone being an entrepreneur, is the ability to be creative. And it had been suppressed all my youth. What a waste. I think if we can encourage our children from a young age to unleash that creative spirit. Every one of you didn't put your hands up, guaranteed you have the ability to be creative. Whether you become a civil servant, Oliver is a very creative chap, um, or whether you become an academic, or whether you go into business, uh, you can be creative. And it's an added benefit and a huge advantage if you have a creative, innovative uh, mindset. Um, isn't it sad that in accounting, it's a negative word, creative accounting? Anyway, that's another another topic. Um, the other point, of course, is lifelong learning. I really passionately believe in lifelong learning. It, again, the students, if you think your learning stops over here, it should never stop. You need to continue learning. I've, as I said, I've been to three business schools. I'm alumnus of three business schools. And uh, my younger son, in fact, told me the saying. I said, where do you get the saying from? Live as if you're going to die tomorrow. Learn as if you're going to live forever. Mahatma Gandhi. So that's so true, and I live by it. Now, the other point, whatever subjects you're doing, um, or you're specialists in, it could be mechanical engineering, civil engineering, electrical engineering, whatever it is, the power is not just collaborative research between institutions, it's cross-discipline collaborative research. So I chaired an initiative at Cambridge University called Tigris, which was the second green revolution here in India to increase crop yields. And not only did I work with one of the top plant scientists in the world, Professor Howard Griffiths at Cambridge, he's world famous as a plant scientist, but it was only successful because he had archeologists, anthropologists, historians working on this team to increase crop yields. And for a few million pounds, we had a huge impact, uh, including in, in things like millet. So I've seen that firsthand how powerful uh, that is. And of course, uh, the other thing is this whole AI. And we've got one of the world experts in AI over here, Professor Mark over there. Now, AI is great. I mean, look, we can't stop pro progress in this chat GPT and stuff. But the reality is that if you look at the Western world, Bologna University is the oldest university in the Western world, which I visited, by the way. Oxford, Cambridge, 800, 900 years old. But those universities started with people getting together to research, to share knowledge. And I think however much we advance technically, we need to have that getting together and, and working together. Um, and I think that's really, really important. And I'm the IoT Madras, uh, Professor, you announced it. I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled. Where's You're in charge of the project, Professor. When I said to you, we're going to start within 12 months, he said, what are you saying 12 months? We're starting in a few months. August we're starting. Uh, this is so exciting. Everyone I mentioned is joint degree to. How wonderful that the students can, you can do your master's here, a few months, Birmingham, a few months, here, a few months. Wow. And you come up with a joint degree from two of the best institutions in the world. I mean, it's incredible. It's such a great idea. It's groundbreaking and I can't wait. Now, here I'm going to give you my dream. My dream is one day this institution will have a physical presence in Birmingham University's campus within our engineering department. That is my dream, and I, I'm, I'm sure it will happen. Uh, 
Also, you, you know, the potential for students to come over here. I remember hosting Her Majesty the Queen and His Royal Highness Duke of Edinburgh a few years ago when she came to open our new dental school. We have one of the best dental schools in the world. It's got how many? 170 beds or something. Um, benches or whatever the dent, you know, when you lie down for a dentist, terrifying experience, but anyway. Uh, so it's state of the art and they came to open it. Now our dental students come here and do volunteer work with a charity called Satya Samaj UK, providing medical and dental aid to underprivileged people in Rishikesh and near Dehradun, where my mother, mother lives. So there's a lot of scope to, to do things both ways. Um, now, I just want to very quickly touch on our India Institute. Our India Institute, uh, which was launched by Ambassador High Commissioner Yash Sinha, from the same regiment as far as my father, um, is five years old this year. And it's, I think, serendipity, five years old, India, G20. I think we're going to have a big event in, in Birmingham to do with that. And the amount of work we're doing through Indian Institute, clean water, clean cooling, plastic rivers, including the Ganga, we've been dealing with that, women's cancer, arthritis, global sur surgical research. One of our professors is coming to Delhi tomorrow. Um, he works in surgery. Do you know more people die after surgery than HIV? TB and malaria combined. And this is researching on how to stop people dying after surgery. Um, railways, we have one of the best railway departments in the world. Our railway department, we have our own university railway station. Oliver, you've used our station. Functioning university railway station. And the railway department, Professor Clive Roberts is world famous. And we won a Queen's Award and we were in Buckingham Palace a few years ago, winning the award. A queen, Queen Majesty Queen, Prince Charles, now King Charles, they come around talking to all of us. And I said to, to, to Prince Charles, I said, sir, do you know this Professor Roberts is working on a model hydrogen train? He said, really? I said, yeah, it's called Hydrogen Hero and it's in the laboratory and they're working on it. And I joked and I said, sir, one day we'll power your royal train with hydrogen. And he laughed, we all laughed. Well, that laughter became reality at COP26 in Glasgow, Fast forward, year before last, we had the world's first retrofitted hydrogen power train developed by the University of Birmingham in partnership with industry and the UK government as well. And Prince Charles was on that train. And so that, that, that is the power. Uh, we've got a Jan studies, sports science. We are number six in the world for sports science. I got Princess Anne to come and open up our state-of-the-art sports center. Commonwealth Games, which took place last year. The University of Birmingham took a bigger role than any university in the history of this planet in any games, Asian, Olympic, or Commonwealth. We hosted hockey, we hosted squash, we sponsored the baton relay, we sponsored the games. We had the athletes' village. Our, our student accommodation is such high quality. We had two thirds of all the athletes from around the world from 72 Commonwealth countries and territories actually staying on campus. So I'm very proud of what we've done. Here's a heads up. This is going to be announced on Friday, but I'm going to tell you now. We've got a new India network to launch life-saving colon cancer trials here in India. We've done them in the UK, and it proves that if you give patients chemotherapy before surgery, it cuts the risk of colon cancer coming back by a huge percentage. And we're going to be launching that trial right here in the UK. So. Finally, Dubai campus. We've had a Dubai campus now opened last year with the first Russell Group University to open a campus uh, in Dubai. And uh, that is going really well. 66 nationalities within the first year. And of course, the number one country the students are from is India. So to conclude, I'm gonna say this. I led the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry in the most challenging time in the most challenging time, I think, for the globe since the Second World War, the pandemic followed by the sad war in Ukraine. And I've found that there's certain attitudes and things that can help you get through, get you through a crisis. And in, I've nearly lost my business three times. Each time was different, but the three things that saw me through, one, having a strong brand, 
So the IIT Madras brand is a very strong brand. Birmingham University brand is a very strong brand. Cobra Beer is a very strong brand. Next is the support of your team and your family. If you have a good, loyal team, that gets you through a crisis. If you have a family, if you're lucky to have family, my wife, I met her one year after I started Cobra. She stood by me through all the ups and downs. I wouldn't be here standing in front of you without her support. And finally, integrity. Playing with a straight bat. Never compromising on the principles. And you can get through any crisis. So, ambitiously, I say, the UK, less than 1% of the world's population, is still sixth largest economy in the world, just overtaken by India, the fifth largest economy in the world. We have 17 out of the top 100 universities in the world, including Birmingham. We have four out of the top 10 universities in the world. We have more world leaders that have come out of British universities than any universities along with America. And Nobel Prizes, it's a British university along with an American that's won more Nobel Prizes than anyone else. What about India? Well, I can say this. At the end of the Ukraine debate, I said the new world order, the United States, superpower. China, like it or not, superpower. But there is a third emerging global superpower, and that is India. In the next 25 years, it's going to be the second largest economy in the world with a GDP of $32 trillion. The Indian Express has left the station. It is now the fastest train in the world. It is the fastest growing major economy in the world. And the UK and India must be the closest friends, trusted friends in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lord Billy Moria, for sharing your insights and inspiring us all. Now we have time for a few questions from the audience. If you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone. Thank you. Who wants to ask a question? If you want to ask a question, yes, please. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Bala, a startup founder. Uh, I would like to know how you expressed your creativity in your business and instance on an example. Okay, yes, I can give you lots of examples. Uh, first is coming up with the idea for Cobra Beer in the first place. Okay. Uh, but also it's the way in which um, you then build your brand. And I think when you're competing against the big brands, yeah. if you're going to do the same old boring stuff, it's not going to work. You've got to do it differently. You've got to do it better. You've got to try and change the marketplace forever. Everything you do, whether it's your advertising, whether it's um, the way you express yourself, the way you operate has got to be creative and innovative. The new products you come out with, and we've, we've brought out lots of new products. So for example, one is a double fermented beer made in Belgium where we use an ale yeast into a lager in a champagne bottle, unpasteurized, never been done in history before. So you can just be innovative. It's like a restless attitude of innovation and creativity uh, all the time. Okay, so can I conclude that the packaging was something that you made it as a creative one which helped you to move forward? Packaging makes a big difference, very much so. But in the beginning, by the way, the brewery could only do big size bottles, you know, the 650 ml bottles. Mm. They said, forget small bottles, forget draft. You prove yourself, then we'll give you the small bottles. So we had to make do with just the big bottles. And you'd learn how to turn obstacles into advantage. So the restaurant would say, what are you giving us this big bottle? We are used to small bottles of draft, please leave. And then you turn that obstacle. You say, well, hang on, you're selling double the quantity of beer. You're selling double at one time. Uh, it's a bottle of beer. You can leave it on the table so your waiters can go and do other things. And they'll share. People will share the bottle and share it with the food. And people at other tables will say, what are they drinking? It looks like a bottle of wine. It's a bottle of beer. I'll have some. It'll spread like wildfire through the restaurant. So that obstacle becomes an advantage. And it's still, we're the first movers with big bottles. And in, in now if you go to the UK in a supermarket, oh. every beer does big bottles as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Any other questions? No? Oh, we've got one at the back, then one here. All right. I'd like to ask, uh, can you talk about some of the mistakes you think you made? Yeah, yeah. 
this is a professor from Virginia. Okay. Uh, now, one of my favorite sayings, good judgment comes from experience and experience comes from bad judgment. You've got to make the mistakes to learn and hopefully not repeat them. Um, and I've made many, many mistakes. Uh, if, if I look back on some of the mistakes I made, hiring the wrong people is one of the biggest mistakes you can make. I nearly lost my business hiring a chief executive who turned out to not just be useless, but unethical. And I discovered that he was trying to, behind my back, do horrible things uh, and take my business away from me. Now, who do I blame for that? <laughs> my fault for hiring the wrong person. So you've always got to take the responsibility. Um, I took on too much debt because I wanted to grow and I sacrificed my profits for growth. Uh, and that worked really well in a time when the economy was booming. My valuation was very high because it was based on high growth, but I didn't demonstrate my profitability and I nearly lost my business during the financial crisis. After that, I've been able to demonstrate that we're very profitable and I could have done that at any time and I didn't do it. Uh, so I could give you many examples of the mistakes that I've I've made, and I've made many of them. <laughs> Thank you. Um, hello, uh, I'm a research scholar here at the humanities department. So um, you mentioned that your business was hit thrice uh, with three crises. So I'm assuming it's the global financial crisis, the pandemic, and uh, the Ukraine war. I'm assuming these three are the crises. No, the, the, uh, the, no that was, but the times I've nearly lost my business before that. But yeah, but these three crises, very much so, you, the, the financial crisis was the time I last time, and I mean last time. But of course, the Ukraine war preceded by the pandemic was a huge test for any business. And fortunately, our brand was very resilient through the pandemic. And here's when diversification matters. I started with the Indian restaurants, but as soon as I could, I started selling it to the supermarkets as well. So we sell to thousands of branches of supermarkets and off licenses in the UK. What happened during the pandemic? The restaurants had to shut down during the lockdown. Their business was closed. It's my supermarket sales that saved me during the pandemic. If I hadn't had this, so if I hadn't had my supermarket sales, I wouldn't have survived. So you, the diversification really helps, um, but our profits plummeted. Um, many people made massive losses as well. We didn't, but yeah, it's a very, very challenging time. Uh, and including for our team and adapting to the new way of working. I don't know about you, but I hated that virtual world. It was terrible. I just wanted to be with people. Um, and when you can't see your team, you can't meet them face to face. You're worried about your customers. You're trying to support your customers. And I just wrote a blog, by the way. Um, it's It's been published at Oxford University. And it is um, government and business working together Two plus two equals five. Usually business is fighting against government and government doesn't understand business. But if you can get the two to work together, it's very powerful. And the pandemic in the UK, we had the government came up with a furlough scheme to save jobs. And I worked as president of CBI with them. And that really helped. Uh, and the government listened eventually. There's a bit of a time lag usually. Uh, normally we as business people, we and entrepreneurs, you see the problem very quickly you see the solution before government has even seen the problem and you want to act quickly. And the challenge is to get government to come along with you as problem, solution, action. And in the pandemic, we managed to do that. One was the furlough scheme, the lateral flow testing, the government wouldn't listen to lateral flow testing. Eventually they listened. Uh, I was insulted in parliament when I asked, use lateral flow testing. No, no, PCR, PCR, PCR. I said, try it, it's cheaper, it's quick. People can carry on working, going to school, Eventually, they listen, and it's in Hansard. Lord Billamore, you won this argument. If they'd done it earlier, we could have saved lockdowns two and three. We could have saved many lives. We could have saved a lot of money. There was a time lag. But eventually, they did listen. We used them so much, the lateral flow tests. We ran out of them in the UK. They were available free to every citizen, free to every business. Finance, government loans. The government banks were not lending. Businesses were shut. We, got, we convinced the government to give 100% guaranteed loans that saved thousands and thousands of businesses. So that's the way you can collaborate business and government working together. Two plus two equals five. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Any more? Hi. Yes. Uh, this is Mahesh. I yes. work as a talent acquisition manager. 
so since the topic says uh, leading in crisis, I would like to understand what kind of a mindset uh, an individual should have when they are hit by crisis. That's a really, really good question. And I think one is to have this sort of entrepreneur's mindset, which is very important, I think, uh, in, 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 in dealing with crisis. I don't think uh, um, a, a sort of FTSE 100 uh, CEO would have been able to deal with it in the same way that I did. And what two things I did, by the way, you know, when India had its second wave of COVID, that horrible second wave, I worked with the Indian High Commissioner she set up a war zone in the Indian High Commission during lockdown. And my team at the CBI and I, we rallied British industry and we sent oxygen cylinders, generators, concentrators, PPE, equipment. People, no one said no. No one said no. And it was amazing how British business rallied and we worked. And it then turned out that we helped more than any other country in the, in the world, thanks to business being a force for good. And the same with the Ukraine war. I've reached out to the Ukrainian ambassador two days after the war started, almost exactly today. You know, the, the, the war started on the 24th last year. I went to see him. He said, I desperately need help. And we did humanitarian help with ration packs and food and medical kits with British business. Again, no one said no. So it's that taking that proactive attitude of not waiting for somebody to ask you, going out and saying, how can I help? And we able, there's a two examples of how we helped. You know, we nearly had a starvation around the world because the port of Odessa was the last Ukrainian port left. And last May, I was told by the Ukrainian ambassador, if that port is not unblocked, millions of people around the world will starve. And Beasley at the UN Food Program, the head of the UN Food Program, said 47 million people are a threat of starvation if that port is not unblocked because you can't get it out by road and rail to get the grain out from the food basket of the world. I lobbied in Parliament with Olaf Scholz in Germany at the B7 before the G7 last year. They brought up at the G7, Turkey, and the UN, eventually with Russia, and the port was opened and we saved many lives through that starvation that would have been caused otherwise. So I could give you example after example of how that mindset and attitude. And finally, Professor John Quelsh, who taught me at Harvard Business School, who was also head of the London Business School, um, he sent me a message when I, the pandemic started, and he said, the, the seven C's of how leaders can manage through a crisis. Here are the seven C's. Calmness, confidence, communication, collaboration, community, compassion, and cash. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I'd like to ask one. Oh, yes. How does one overcome fear of messing up in life, messing up new endeavors, as in as you've taken up so many new things? That is such a good question. You know, fear of failure, um, fear to just even try something, it's a natural feeling. Um, I think it prevents a lot of people, it prevents a lot of people from even trying. Now, how can I just say, you know, maybe there are certain people who do you have the, the constitution to have a go? How can you have that bravery? And the Duke of Wellington, um, who's one defeated Napoleon Battle of Waterloo, his motto is fortune favors the bold. And I really believe that you have to be able to just be brave and do it. That guts, I told you, the guts to do it in the first place, the guts to stick with it when others would give up. By the way, you also have to know when to give up. I shared the platform with Jimmy Wales. Has anyone heard who Jimmy Wales is? Anyone know? Wikipedia, founder of, well done, founder of Wikipedia. I shared the platform with him a couple of times. First time, we both said this uncorroborated. Entrepreneurs never give up, but they also know when to give up. Now, come on, that's completely contradictory. And it's so true. When I started, before I started Cobra, I was getting experience of importing products from India. I'm from Hyderabad. Any lady who goes to Hyderabad buys a string of pearls. We will corner the world pearl market with all our contacts in Hyderabad. My partner, business partner, even went on a pearl course. We couldn't sell one string of pearls. The Japanese pearls are better quality and cheaper. Do you think we should have carried on banging our heads against that brick wall to try and send pearls? Of course not. Through our contacts, Bombay dyeing, you know, the towels and bed sheets and things. We got the agency for Bombay dyeing bath towels for the whole of the UK, licensed to print money. We couldn't sell a single bath towel. 
Why? The Portuguese bath towels were much better quality, cheaper, less freight from Portugal to the UK. We couldn't sell a thing. Should I have carried on trying to send Bombay dying bath towels? So you also got to know when, when to give up uh, as well. So thank you for the question. We have one more question. Yes. Sir, you talked about uh, five C's that we managed, how we managed to uh, deal with the crisis. Can you elaborate more upon communication? As you said, the trust and credibility, creating credibility among team members and your family is important. How you communicate your values and maintain the team and your trust among them? Thank you. The seven C's, communication was one of them, and that's a really, really good question. I could just give you a glib answer saying, you've got to communicate. You've got to connect with your people. It's very difficult when you can't see them face to face. You know, the lockdown was a horrible, it's never happened before in history. Think about it, this whole lockdown concept. And we can debate whether it's the right thing to do or not, and for how long. But it was very challenging to communicate in those circumstances, to try and keep people's morale up when you are in that scenario. And in a crisis, communication is, I mean, it's absolutely just crucial to be able to do it. But the key is to be able to do it in a believable way. And here I will tell you, have any of you heard of the Stockdale Paradox? Anyone heard of the Stockdale Paradox? No? Okay, I learned this at Harvard as well, at business school. There was Admiral Stockdale, when he was a younger officer, was taken a prisoner of war in Vietnam. And he was in horrific conditions for many years. And when he came out, he said, they said, why did you survive? whereas just about everyone else who was taken prisoner of war with you has died. And they analyzed the whole thing, and I'm summarizing it for you in just two minutes. They, he said, well, there were those who were really over-optimistic, and they'd say, we'll be home by Christmas, and Christmas would never come, and they'd just die of just complete despondency. At the other extreme, there were those who literally could not take the physical, mental, horror, torture of every day. He said, my attitude was, every day when I woke up, I knew it was going to be a nightmare. I knew I was going to get tortured. I was not going to get enough to eat. I knew it was going to be a hell on earth. But I knew one day I would get home. So that combination of that realism faced with, also combined with a sense of faith in the future, is the Stockdale paradox. And I think You've got to communicate. If people can, when you're communicating as a leader, that you're real, that you're not false promises or giving false hope, you're also being very realistic. People will trust you. And to get trust from people, this is a very important thing. It's another lesson I learned from one of my business school professors. She described Francis Fry, trust as a triangle. If you want to get trust from people, one, you've got to be authentic. So what I've just been saying. Secondly, you've got to have logic. You've got to have the capability, professional capability, the knowledge, to deliver what you're promising. And the third, empathy. You've got to care for the other people. Authenticity, logic, empathy, and you can get trust from people, which is down to the communication as well. Thank you, really good question. Right, thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you for the questions. I would now request Professor Raghunathan Rengaswamy to present our esteemed guest, Lord Biri Moria, with a token of our gratitude. I now request Professor Preeti Aghalayam, Faculty Advisor at the Office of Global Engagement, to deliver the vote of thanks.
Thank you, Lord Billimoria. That was really fascinating. Um, I did wonder what um, ambitious is, but I think you demonstrated that through the course of your talk. So thank you for that illustration of that um, strange word as well. I think the audience really enjoyed every single moment of your presentation and also particularly the questions. It felt like they put you on a bit of a spot, but I saw you had notes to answer the questions. Wondering if you seeded the question somehow beforehand or something set up like that. Um, thank you, lovely audience. Uh, you've been fantastic. You've been great. Uh, thanks are also due to, uh, of course, my friends. Robin seems remarkably awake despite the long day. Um, we've had a very uh, lovely discussion about our uh, joint MSc program with Rosa Mark, with Dipankar and others. And we are also really excited, really looking forward to it. I think this is the beginning of great things that we'll do together for sure, absolutely. Office of Global Engagement, you all have been really, really very organized and uh, made us proud. Uh, Satya Mai, uh, she asked this question because this is the first time she's done this, um, being the master of ceremonies. I think she came out really great guns and we didn't detect any fear. That's all. Good night, everyone. Uh, we would like to request uh, the delegation and Lord Billy Moria to remain. Uh, we would like to take some pictures. I don't want to be a very good one.